ان هم لله ان هم لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اصل بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدا يتيما يتي الله رسول فقد رشد اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك وسلم المؤمنين المؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات اما بعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتوا الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الذين امنوا ان تنصروا الله ينصركم ويثبت قدامكم يا ايها الذين امنوا اصبروا وصابروا وربتوا واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون all praise and gratitude is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as wa jal we praise him in a fashion befitting his majesty we seek air hope aid guidance instruction and solace only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that which lurks within our inner souls and is manifested in our wicked action and behavior Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the book Oh you believe fear Allah with the fear which is due to him and do not die unless you are in a state of submission unto him as muslim Oh you believe if you help Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will help you and he will make your foothold very firm Oh you believe endure all kinds of hardships I'll do all others in endurance and be ready and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order that you may be successful In the brief amount of time that we have together we're going to be talking about the issue of social justice in Islam. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says let there arise out of you a band of people inviting to all that is good and joining what is right and forbidding what is wrong they are the ones to attain felicity. When we talk about the issue of social justice we have to be reminded that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute is al-adl the just. And Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna Allah yamru bil adli wa ihsan. He loves the doing of good and he loves that which is just. When we see how this issue of justice has been played out in the Islamic context we have only to look within the confines of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala's book where he tells you stand firmly for justice as witnesses unto Allah even against yourself be just that is nearer to acquiring taqwa the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has says has said about oppression that oppression according to hadith qudsi is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made unlawful for himself and he does not allow oppression for his slaves or his servants this means all of mankind not whether muslims just regarding non-muslims i mean everybody even tamia has said in regards to this civilization is rooted in justice and the consequences of oppression are devastating therefore it is said allah aids the just state even if it is a non-muslim state and he was hold his help from the oppressive state even if it is a muslim state Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a muslim is the brother of another muslim he neither oppresses him no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said a muslim is a brother of a muslim he neither oppresses him nor does he fail him he neither lies to him nor do he hold him in contempt the whole of a muslim for another muslim is inviolable his blood his property and his honor when we talk about oppression we see that the day is full with all kinds of evil wanton injustice corruption being perpetuated by muslims and being perpetuated by non-muslims but these things have no 
relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah stands with those who are just even if they are Muslim or contrary even if they are non-Muslims. Whoever does just, Allah will aid them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought upon us a great trial and great fitna. We see the Muslim ummah is beset by many types of difficulties and hardships. We see Muslims oppressing other Muslims, Muslims killing other Muslims. We look at what is happening in Africa under the, the, the so-called name of Islam. People are kidnapping people's daughters and children and they're marrying them off and feeling that this is just in the eyesight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a Muslim's life, his property, and his honor are sacred with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all know the story about the woman who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, my father has told me to marry a certain man. He says, do I have to marry him? He says, no, you have that right to decline. And she says, he asked her, do you want to have the marriage or no? He says, no, I, I'm going to go along with the marriage, but I just want people to know that I have that right. That, that, that right was upon her. When the Prophet ﷺ went into Mecca, we see that Umm Hani, the sister of Ali Anhu, put certain individuals who were non-Muslims under her protection. And she sent word to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that these individuals are not to be harmed, are not to be dealt with wrongly, that they are under my protection and no one has a right to do any harm to them. And this is the same way when Muslims have non-Muslims coming to their land and they're coming there under a contract under the protection of Muslims that that ha has a right and obligation upon you. So much so that during the time of Salahuddin Ayyubi that one man, one, one, not when one woman came to Salahuddin Ayyubi and said my daughter has been taken and he looked and had it searched all throughout the Muslim realm to find this woman's daughter and to give her her daughter back. And he told her that you will be under the protection of me and no one will harm you if you go and look for your daughter. This is the justice of Islam. And we have to bring the justice of Islam back to the whole reality before the Muslims. In order to do that, we have to look towards the Quran and we have to look towards the hadith of the Prophet the Prophet وسلم, said on the day of Yama Kiyama that zoom or oppression will come like an army or a cloud to be destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never to be established again. So therefore there will be no just injustice done to a creation on the day of judgment. Even an animal who has been harmed by the breaking of his horn by another animal will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be judged. And the injustice done will be meted out. And the punishment will be meted out. And we know that our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is between kawf and rajab. Between fear and hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hoping for the jinnah and fearing a day of retribution when we will have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will see with our eyes the hellfire being brought before the creation carrying by 70,000 angels upon 70,000 thongs or handles and then when the hellfire is nay near to mankind it was shoot across the heads of the whole entire creation. And everyone will fall down in fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. And even the Khalilullah, Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam will say, Ana Khalil, am I not your friend Allah ta'ala? Because he 
would be more fearful before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day. The hellfire which has been kindled for 1,000 years until it was red hot. Another 1,000 years until it was white and smoke. Another 1,000 years until it's billows and billows and billows of darkness. We're in the lowest depths of hell. Allah will punish those who transgress against his servants. The Prophet Sallallahu has said that a person who kills a kafir dhimi, someone who is protected by the Islamic government or Islamic society, someone who kills this man wantonly and unjustly, he will not even smell the fragrance of paradise. He will not smell the fragrance of paradise. That even a non-believer has rights in an Islamic society. The only tax they have to pay is, is the tax of a kafir zimri. That's it. They don't have to pay like a Muslim have to pay all these taxes to maintain the Islamic state, the government, to fight, to war. None of these things are placed upon those people who are living within an Islamic society. So important was that that the Prophet Sallallahu when he saw that children was killed in one particular struggle. He admonished those people who had done this, who have done this. We do not kill women and children. We do not kill those who are non-combatants. We do not destroy crops, nor do we kill cattle. We do not fight like the non-Muslims fight. We don't fight to destroy, but we fight to eradicate evil and injustice wherever it may be. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, stand up firmly for justice, he's given us a command to stand up firmly. He says in the Quran, Kum tum khayru ummatin ukhrijat linas wa tamaroonu bil maruf wa tanhanan in il munka wa tukminuna billah. You are the best ummah evolved for the benefit of mankind. Why? Because you enjoin what is good and you forbid what is evil. And even if that evil is done by yourselves, you stand condemned before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these individuals who call themselves whatever, but they come disguised as Muslims and they are perpetuating injustice and harm against innocent human beings. These people are violating the shadid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give them hidayah and that he change their hearts and their mind and to realize that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came as rahmatil lil alameen as mercy to all of mankind. He did not come as a destroyer, but he came with a law which would establish justice between all human beings. So that even after the death of the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Umar was told that you had Christians who are living in other areas under the control of the Muslims, and that these people drank wine and they eat swine. He says, that is their right. That is their law. We do not interfere in how they practice their faith. As long as they're not selling that liquor to the Muslims and encouraging that evil to be put upon the ummah, whatever they do within their confines, howsoever they legislate themselves, Unless they bring it to the Muslims, this will be in accordance with what they have done. The justice of Islam in a historical context is only to be manifest in the life of one companion of the Prophet Wasallam, And that was Bilal ibn al-Rabbah, 
who was tortured and humiliated by the Quraysh. And all he will say was Ahad, 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 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was one. He did not have that much knowledge about Islam. He did not have Bukhari Hadith. He did not have Abu Dawood, even Timothy, or any of these other sources of Islam. But he understood Rabbu Samawati wal Ad, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Lord of the heavens and the earth. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there is no might nor power except Allah. And then if Allah chooses him to die, he will die. But he would not give up this la ilaha illallah. As the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Dhar, do not give up this la ilaha illallah. Even if you are burnt alive, crucified, or cut into pieces. Why? Because this la ilaha illallah, mithuhu jinnati shahadatu la ilaha illallah, that the key to jinnah is la ilaha illallah. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. You should renew your faith. He tells the companions, renew your faith. How can we renew our faith, O Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, by much remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let your tongue become moist with the remembrance of Allah. And nothing is greater than the dhikr of la ilaha illallah. But we don't understand the magnitude of that. That when a person says la ilaha illallah, his life his property and his honor are sacred to another Muslim. You cannot take a brother's honor away from him by defiling, ridiculing, and mocking him. You have no right to take his life unjustly because you deem your brand of Islam to be the only brand of Islam. And you have no right to take away a person's property unless he gives it of his own free will in Islam. So when we look at Abu Zahid Anhu, at the time that he converted to Islam, he was the first one to recite La ilaha illallah in the, in the Kaaba to the Quraysh. They pounced upon him to the point that he almost died. Abu Bakr come by, but Anu says, no, if you kill this man, his people are in the control of your caravan route, and they will attack you. But it was Abu Dhar who said, in relationship to Bilal, Anu, you are the son of a black mother. And he said it in a derogatory sense. What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa do? He told him that you are on the ways of jahiliyyah. You are on the ways of jahiliyyah. What does jahiliyyah mean? It means you are in the state of ignorance. It's like you never took your shahada. You never bore witness to Islam. Because when people come into Islam, ukhuwa imaniya, they come into one collective unified brotherhood. And before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of you are equal. And the noblest of you in the eyesight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the black over the white, or the white over the black, or the Arab over the non-Arab, or the non-Arab over the Arab. No, it has something to do with taqwa. Taqwa hahunna. Taqwa is a condition of the heart. The Prophet Sallallahu said, there's a piece of flesh in your body that if it's good, good permeates all over. And that flesh is the heart. We know how we can clean glass. Get some glass cleaner. Clean your clothes, you use laundry detergent. Clean your whites, you may put in a little bleach. But how do you clean your heart? Verily, your prayer will protect you from lewdness and wicked acts. And the greatest object of, a, of life 
is the constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala zikullahi wa akbar. The remembrance of Allah. That your tongue becomes moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear Allah ta'ala azza wa jal. And be an inviter and enjoiner to that which is good. The reward for Bilal really on who is with that Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him to be the first Mu'addin. And conceptualize that in your mind. The black feet of Bilal climbing up the Kaaba. Standing on top of the Kaaba. Calling the Adhan. Humiliating the Quraysh. And those people who have enslaved him and enslaved his kind and ridiculed him, he's saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And all they can do is hold their heads down. And they knew that from that point on, Islam would become victorious. And so they in droves, they began to become Muslim because the Muslims had control of the Kaaba. But he was also the first Mu'adhan to call for the Adhan for the Prophet in Medina. And the Arabs, some of them, said he, his accent wasn't that great. His Arabic is not that good. He keeps saying, Hayya la salah. And there's some deficiency in his Hayya. So they bring a brother out who's an Arab, and he calls the Adhan like Abdul Basit. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And everybody's saying, Oh, wow. Man, this, did you hear that Adhan? The Prophet وسلم, did not come out of his chambers. They knocked on the, the door to the Prophet's quarters, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, Ya Rasulullah, did you hear that? He says, no. He says, go and tell Bilal to call the Adhan. Allahu Akbar. Because he said that whatever imperfection in his recitation, because of his relationship with Allah Ta'ala Azawajal, Allah has improved. And accepted the Adhan. Allahu Akbar. When Umar ibn Qatab went into Al Quds and cleared the foundation for Masjid Al Aqsa, Bilal was there. And he employed him. Oh, Bilal called the Adhan. And you know, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet companion, Bilal, did not call the Adhan for anyone, except when Hassan and Hussein caught him at the grave of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they employed him, go and call the Adhan. And he, when he called the Adhan, the people started coming out crying, remembering the days in which Islam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was amongst them. And everybody began to cry, and Bilal asked Abu Bakr, allow me to go out al jihad fi sibilillah, because I do not wish to stay here. Because seeing the, the, the Prophet is gone, I have no feelings in my heart. And so he did not call the Adhan after that time that he was requested. But now, at this time, he felt. He should call the Adhan because Muhammad sallallahu went on Al Iswa wa Maraj and he established prayer there. And so he called the Adhan and Masjid al Aqsa. So he had the honor of being the first Mu'addin. He called the Adhan in Medina, he called the Adhan in Mecca, and he called the Adhan in Al Quds. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exalted him. And when Umar ibn Qatab was the Khalifa, he came to him, and there were kings and high aristocrats around the quarters of Umar waiting for 
an audience. And they was told that Bilal was out there. And so they rushed Bilal in. And they said, why are you bringing this man in here, you know, to show you how racism is? Why are you bringing this man in here and we're here? Well, I'm a king. <laughs> you know, this man is an aristocrat. This man is a wealthy man. He says, Bilal is our master. And he was freed by our master. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. This is the nobility of the dignity and honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought upon Bilal. Because that is the justice of Islam. That Islam came to destroy all vestiges of racism and evil and hate. That's why the Prophet said in his last khutbah, you are brothers one unto another and you should do justice and you should stand against injustice. And that is something that we should take to heart. Rabia ibn Amun radi al-anhum walking into the chambers of Rustam, who is the general of the Persians. Imagine this in your mind, a big man with a small shield and a big spear, and he's just sticking the carpet, he's just sticking the carpet as he's walking up to Rustam. And everybody knows that the best carpet in the world is Persian carpet, right? But he's showing his contempt for this Persian carpet. He's just sticking his spear into it. And so Rustam asked him, he says, why are you here? Why are you here? He says, we come to deliver mankind from the worship of man to the worship of Allah. From the narrow constraints of this dunya to the vastness of the akira, from the injustices to the justice of Islam. From oppression and tyranny to the justice of Islam. This is what he told Rustam. So Islam came as a liberating factor for all of mankind. That's why you see entering into the fold of, of, of the Muslims, people of all walks of life. And in Islam, no one is insignificant in the eyesight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even Abu Dha who made that derogatory statement about Bilal. When the Prophet ﷺ said, you are on Jahiliyyah, he took Bilal's feet and put it on his head. And he said, oh, Bilal, hold your feet on my head as long as this racist notion is in my mind. And if you ever read any stories about Abu Dhab, you can see why he was ostracized or he was put into seclusion by the Umayyad dynasties because he actually the father of revolution. Never did he harbor any notions of racism, but he had a conceptualization that wealth should be not hoarded, but wealth should be distributed amongst the people and shared so that there can always be some alleviated of poverty because he considered poverty a form of injustice. So we need as Muslims to look into the Islamic sources, look into the Quran and look into the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and see the beauty of this deen. Then we will understand why Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz rahmatullah said perhaps if white America was to study Islam, <laughs> it may change that which is within them. We in 2014 and they still do not have any love, sentiment, or consideration from those descendants or Af of enslaved Africans who were enslaved in America. And many Muslims do not understand why are you demonstrating, why are you protesting, why are you standing up? We stood for Ahmed Dudialo. And the African community was not standing up. We stood for Zango. And the African community was not standing up. Muhammad Bah, may Allah have mercy upon all of them, we stood up for them. 
We still got Surah for Suwaib, the son of our Imam, former Emir of the Masjid Ashura, Imam Abdul Latif. We stood up and we protested and we demonstrated and we said this was wrong. That you need to evaluate your policies and how these people approach their citizens. But now we see what's happening in Ferguson, what's happening in Staten Island, what's happening all throughout the, co the country is a clear manifestation of what Al Haj and Malik Shabazz was talking about. It's a clear manifestation that Islam is a way of life because it brings into existence Ukhuwa Imania, a collective unified brotherhood based upon Tawheed, not superficial barriers of language, not no balkanization of lands and materials, but based upon the Quran and the prophetic traditions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first thing that Muhammad Sallallahu <laughs> developed in Mecca was he talked about Tawheed, ta uh, ta uh, ta uh, tawheed the oneness of Allah. But also he solidified and strengthened the brotherhood. And when he went to Medina, he paired off brothers from Mecca with the people from Medina to dispel and to destroy forever the indifferences between each and every one of us. And to let her know that if black has no superiority over white, nor white has any superiority over black except by taqwa. Whoever manifests this taqwa, this piety, this God consciousness is the one who is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a wajal. If he's a white man and he's pious and he lives a righteous life and he does the amr salihat, the good actions and good deeds, he is pleasing to Allah. If he's a black man and he does the same thing, he is the most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we see going on in America, and I'm going to wrap it up. Very quickly is the new Jim Crow. You know, this is what's happening in America. That we thought that after the civil rights struggle of the 1960s, that our struggle ended. And the doors was open to us. Many of us lived under the, the illusion of inclusion. <laughs> you know, that we have a place, <laughs> that everything was all right. So we moved into their neighborhoods, and we moved away from our communities, and we moved away from our friends and our families, and we lived our life. But now we find more and more instances of racism institutionalized racism being perpetuated against us. Our children are being sh shot. Our grandchildren are being shot. Our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, even grandma. You all remember Evelyn Bumpers, 67-year-old black woman in her own house living in the project. They had no a, a bogus eviction notice. She paid her money. They shot her for her arm with a shotgun. And that enabled, enabled her, disabled her. But that was not enough. They shot another one in her to her chest and killed her. 67-year-old woman. And people have the audacity to say, why are you upset? Why are you crying? Because life is sacred. Whoever saves a life, if he has saved all of humanity, Whoever takes a life as if he had destroyed all of humanity. Every soul stands before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as something with value and worth. So we have this new Jin Proism. And the Majlis Ashura is encouraging all of the brothers and all of the sisters to stand with those people who are standing up. Not to be silent, not to be a spectator, but take an active role in saying that there has to be some type of discussion about this issue of institutionalized racism. There have to be some discussion about changes in the system. 
not band-aid solutions, <laughs> not something to satisfy the people, but justice. If it was justice, if you take Islam, a man's life is, 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 is worth something. And I'm going to end with this. One time during the time of Umar ibn Khattab, a man came, or well not a man, a young man. He was actually, he didn't come, he was carried by two younger boys. And it was told to Umar that this young boy had killed their father. So the young boy said, yes, I killed him. I didn't mean to kill him, but he threw a rock and he hit my camel in the face and his eye was taken out. And I was f felt ha ha hurt. He's damaged my property. So out of impulse, he just threw the rock and hit the man, but accidentally he killed the man. So the two young boys said they killed, he killed our father, we want him to be killed. So Umar said, we have to execute the judgment because the punishment, an eye for an eye. Islam is clear, an eye for an eye. That's why if you, if you had that concept, people won't just wantonly kill anybody. So the young man said to Umar, he said, afford me an opportunity to go and to make right my affairs. I have a younger brother. I have some monies and something to take care of him in my absence. And hopefully this will be enough to be sufficient. Give me three days. And Umar said, is there anybody to vouch for this man? Is anyone would be a guarantee for him? You know what a guarantee means? It means that in the event that he doesn't come back, you put your life on the line, that you would be executed in his place. And they looked, he looked around, and nobody said anything. Everybody put their heads down. And from the back of the audience here is Abu Dhar. He says, I will be a guarantee for him. He says, do you know what you're saying? He says, yes, I will vouch for him. He says, you know the young man? I don't know the young man. So the man was allotted the opportunity to go for three days. And after three days, the two young boys came and picked up Abu Dhar and said, well, the young boy didn't come back. You got to give up your life. So Abu Dhar said, well, mashallah, I gave my word. So he went with them. And he went into the chambers of Umar. And the people began to follow because they knew who Abu Dhar was in his relationship to the Prophet he was a noble man, a very aesthetic, pious believer. <coughs> so Umar said, well, he says, you have to wait until Maghrib because the day, the third day, is not completed until after Maghrib. So at the time of the Adhan of Salatul Maghrib, the young boy runs into the masjid and submits himself. And Umar asked him, he said, why didn't you run? <laughs> you had three days <laughs> to run. Maybe he would have forget, you know, overlooked Abu Dhar, let him go. He says, no, he says, because when a Muslim gives his word, you know, like we say, word is your bond, he stood on his word. And he said he did, want not, he did not want a Muslim who was a dear companion of the Prophet Sallallahu to be killed in his place. Allahu Akbar. And he asked Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, did you know this man? He said, I don't know him. He says, but why would you be a guarantee for him? He says, because of the fact he said he did not want it to be said that there was a Muslim crying out in need and that there was no one there to protect him, or no one to stand up for him. Allahu Akbar. This is the love of brotherhood. And the two boys whose father was killed, their eyes begin to cry. And they say, we forgive the brother for the sake of Allah. Allahu Akbar. This is the beauty of this deen. This is the nobility of the character of the men who shaped this Islam. 
This is what we have to look towards as Muslims. And this is what we have to begin to work on within ourselves to bring about a, a significant change within ourselves to be a, a semblance of that honor and nobility. May Allah who subhanahu with the guidance of right. Let's stop. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأكبرت المتكين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وآله وأصحابه وأقل بيته وأزواجه وذرياته الجميل برحمتك يا أهم رحمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد أبدك ورسولك وصل مؤمنين ومؤمنات ومسلمين ومسلمات يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن تنصوا الله ينصركم ويصابك دمكم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اصبروا وصابروا وربتوا واتقوا الله لا لكم تفلحون اللهم آمين all you believe fear Allah with the fear which is due to him and don't die unless you're in the state of submission unto him as Muslims all you believe if you help Allah سبحانه وتعالى Allah will help you we are encouraging you who have the time and who are able to come and march with all of those people who are raising their bo- voices in condemnation against this new Jim Crow and asking for justice or a more just system to be established in place of the corrupt and evil one where people will feel not afraid of the police but protected by the police, not harassed by the police, but who know the complete. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change the people's hearts and to change the people's minds to that which is good. Allahu ameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fa akarati hasana wa kina azabana. Rabbana la tazud kalubana ba'di id hadaytana wa hablana minna duk rahma inna kanta wahab. Rabbana la tazud tazudna fitna taladheena kafuru wa gfilnana rabbana inna kanta lazizu hakeem. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك وصلى المؤمنين والمؤمنات ومسلمين ومسلمات ربنا اغفر لنا وعفو عنا في الدنيا والآخرة إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من دوك رحمة إنك أنت وهاب ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة الذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآل آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العظيم اللهم اكفلي أقيم الصلاة